Lord's put on my heart uh, on this matter of the oneness of the body. And the reason is because that's his prayer. You know, that's his prayer right before he went to the cross. Uh, this was at the Last Supper. He prayed this at the Last Supper. The very end of the Last Supper, he prayed that they may be one. That was his ask, and he asked this three times. Right? He didn't just ask, ask once. He asked three times to the Father that they may be one. Okay? And the they there is it's not just referring to his disciples, but to all those who would believe after after the disciples right that means everyone all of us who have believed that we may be one and and so a lot of you know this matter of oneness of course a lot of christians uh don't like to talk about it because it's a big it's it's just kind of a it's just a kind of a can of worms to talk about oneness among christians uh you know so christians don't like to talk about it because there's so much fighting and arguments among christians right i mean uh, if you've been around for a while, you know that there are a lot of arguments. And this, these arguments have been going on for, for centuries. It's not like, and they keep res coming back. I mean, it's like, I thought that problem is solved. Oh, no, no, that problem is not solved. It's coming back, right? I mean, uh, you know, how should people get uh, one save, always saved, right? Or do, can you lose your salvation? And then when is the tribulation? Is it, when is the rapture? I mean, just on and on. And so... Uh, and so a lot of churches been developed, a lot of divisions been developed through that, all these divisions. So that's why people don't like to talk about oneness or else they would just say, well, that will be in the by and by. Right? One day in the heavens, then we'll all be one. Then for sure, for sure, we'll all be one, you know, in the kingdom, in the heavens somewhere. But anyway, but the Lord's prayer is he prays specifically he says, I do not pray that you take them out of the world. That was his prayer. He says, I do not pray that they would you take them out of the world, but that they stay in the world, but they will be kept in the world. And then eventually he says that they would be one that the world will believe. So in other words, the Lord's praying that when there is oneness, then the world believes. I mean, isn't that the... I mean, we, you know, Christians, we love evangelism, right? I mean, that's, you know, we love to talk, you know, bring people to the Lord, and which is wonderful, right? Which is wonderful. But listen, that's what the Lord says. When you're one, the world believes. You know how much money we spend on evangelism? Christians, right? We spend a lot of money. I heard, Doug, I heard that there was this uh, big evangelistic uh, gathering of, maybe 10,000 people, right? They spend millions of dollars, right? Millions of dollars in Sacramento, right? And, uh, and then, then the, the report came back, what, six people or something? Six people came to the Lord after spending millions of dollars on programs and, 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 and uh, music groups and speakers and travel and all that. Six people, right? Well, praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. But, but yeah, but, but here's the thing though. Yeah. Oh yeah. Millions of dollars. But here's, I mean, here's, here's, but the oneness, I mean, you, you guys are witnessing this. I mean, it, there's no programs. There's no big speakers. He's just in, in the homes in the hallway in the cafeteria, right? People are getting saved, right, Troy? People are coming to the Lord. Why? Because there is a oneness that's going on that's impacting, impacting the world around us. Okay, so look, I mean, people talk about the kingdom. Uh, you know, that's kind of a big topic, right? Kingdom, you know, the kingdom message. Well, the Lord says, if the kingdom is divided against itself, it can't stand. Right. That's, that's the Lord's word. So if we're gonna talk about the kingdom, then we have to talk about the oneness of the kingdom because there's only one kingdom. Are there two kingdoms? No, there's only one kingdom, right? And the kingdom, when the kingdom is one, then the enemy is defeated, right? The enemy is defeated. So when, when the believers are one, the world believes. So that's what the Lord's prayer is. And because of that Lord's prayer, that's the Lord's put that in my heart to speak about the oneness of the body. Okay, now the other word that I want to bring up 
is the Greek word ecclesia, okay? And now, uh, who has heard of that word ecclesia? Probably, okay, who has not heard of that word ecclesia? Okay, you have not heard of it. Okay, all right, that's fine. Uh, now, that word is where the English translation, most of the translation translated to church. So when Jesus said, uh, I will build my ecclesia, okay, that's the actual Greek word, I will build my ecclesia, English translation, most of them is translated to church. Now, we have to deal with this matter of church or ecclesia, we have to talk about it because after faith, after faith is really church or ecclesia. How do we know that? Well, first of all, how, how much trouble is the matter of church causing? I mean, from, you know, from, uh, you know, good things too, not, not just trouble, good things, but from the, but just think of all the, uh, uh, from the worldly, even from the worldly point of view, they say, hey, all you the churches, the people are power hungry, they're money hungry, they're, you know, they're fighting against each other. So the matter of church is a, is a big topic. And um, so, and also because of that, a lot of Christians don't like to talk about church either. Okay, that's not a favorite topic to talk about. It's, like, it's kind of like, let's not talk about uh, you know, politics, okay? Because when you talk about politics, you end up in an argument. It's almost like that. Talking about church, you end up in an argument or you get depressed, okay? But, uh, but the thing is, the Lord says, I will build my ecclesia. I will build my ecclesia. So what is that? Okay, well, the ecclesia is the gathering of his people. Okay, let's first, let's talk about, um, what's that? I'm sorry? Say it again. So go ahead and say it. Meetings? Okay, meetings. Okay, but it's more than a meeting. It's much more than a meeting. Okay, so let's talk about what, how did this word ecclesia came to be? Okay, ecclesia. The word ecclesia is actually used about 500 B.C. It started about 500 B.C. So it's not a word that Jesus invented. In fact, it's been a popular, it was a popular thing just about every Greek city, every Greek town had an ecclesia, okay? And it started about 500 B.C. and then it, uh, it continued and adopted by the Romans. So by the time Jesus was around, when he says, I will build my ecclesia, nobody asks, nobody say, well, well what is that? Okay, nobody asks, what is that? Okay, because it was a known word. It was a known event, okay? And uh, so this event, this ecclesia, what was it? Well, this ecclesia is that, you know, the democracy started by the Greeks, right? That's where democracy was born. So this ecclesia is made up of people, citizens, representatives from, from the the town or the city and they're called out to a gathering an assembly and that assembly is composed of representatives from every subgroup inside the community right so the subgroup would be rich people poor people f farmers right uh, professionals soldiers uh, Greeks Jews and you know different ethnic groups so th those are all the subgroups inside a community and when they have an ecclesia that means everyone from uh, uh, the subgroup is represented to discuss the state of that city they're going to make decisions okay they make decisions in that ecclesia and then they have a vote so everybody can speak and then they vote and that's ecclesia Okay, so when Jesus came, he says, well, I'm going to build mine. I'm going to build my, my ecclesia. That means he's going to have his people that's called out from various. So that's why in Revelation it says he called out every tribe, tongue, and nation, right, to be 
a priest, a, a kingdom of priests to rule over the earth. Okay, so that's his ecclesia. So uh, then you have, that's what Jesus died for. That's what he died for. When at, right after he says, I'm going to build my ecclesia, then he says, I'm going to the cross. Okay, so his whole death and resurrection is for the building up of his ecclesia. And this ecclesia, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, go ahead and go to the Bible, yeah. Okay, well, um, okay, well, let me go to, um, well, here's, here's, the, here's where the Matthew 16, 15, okay, that's, uh, that's where he, when he says, who do you say that I am, right? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. So that is faith. That is a direct revelation from the Father, and that brings faith. That's what it means to have faith in Jesus, is that you recognize him as the Christ, the Son of the living God. If you do not recognize him as that, then in today's term, you're not yet a believer. Okay, is when you recognize him as this Christ, the Son of the living God, then boom, you are blessed. You are blessed because you have faith, okay? So <clears throat> then the next verse says, so right after that verse, it says, and I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my assembly or ecclesia, okay? So the, if you read your English Bible, most of the translation will say, I will build my church, okay, here. But it's really the Greek word is ecclesia. The word church, even if you look it up in the dictionary and look it up in entomology.com, the word church comes from a completely different Greek word. It's completely different Greek word, okay? And that Greek word is actually is from a, a Lord's house, okay? A house for worshiping the Lord now, that could be a, an idolatrous Lord, okay? That Lord there is not the Lord Jesus, is the Lord of an idol. So that word church in the Greek actually is referring to an actual building, okay? So then you'll say, well, why did it be translated this way? Why does so many, tra so many translated, translated to church? Well, you could say, well, I'll say it, it's, it's a conspiracy. Who did that? Yeah, who did that conspiracy? Well, the conspiracy started like this. Tyndale was the first, William Tyndale is the first translator of the English Bible. When he translated the English Bible, the first English Bible, he translated ecclesia to congregation or assembly, okay? Not church. Then you know what happened to him because he translated that word to a, a assembly or congregation and not church? Well, he got burned at the stake. <laughs> yes, you read it up. It's history. Who burned him at the stake? It was the Roman church. The Roman church burned Tyndale at the stake, okay, because he would not change this word to church. Then, you, then, then uh, 60 years later, I think, about King James wanted to translate his version, which became the kind of the bedrock of all English translations. Well, about 85% of King James translation came from Tyndale, okay? But then if you say, well, if it came from Tyndale, shouldn't you just follow Tyndale and translate, right, his translation of Ecclesia to assembly or congregation? Well, no, King James made like he had 11 rules or 15 rules. And rule number three is you cannot translate ecclesia to congregation or assembly. You have to translate it to church. So that was King James rule. Okay, so you say, well, why? What's the conspiracy here? Because conspiracy here is this, is that if the, the church is the building and 
Somebody owns that building. Somebody owns that building. And if you go to that building, you will have to um, behave according to the owner of the building tells you to behave. Okay, so the Roman church, of course, they want people to go to church, right? They want people to go to church because if they go to church, then they can be under the authority of the Roman church. And then what about King James? Well, King James was the head of the Anglican church. Did you guys know this? Right, King James was the head of the Anglican church, which is the church in England, Church of England. Right? The Church of England is the Anglican Church and King James was the head. So he wanted his subjects to go to church. Okay, Because if they go to church, again, that means that they would be under supervision. Okay, If, if, if it's just a congregation, if it's just an assembly, well, you could be assembling anywhere. Then you lose, you lose control over, over people. So that's why uh, Roman Church... King James kept it to church. And so that's been the, that became the tradition. So now when we say church, everybody thinks of, well, the building. Yes, everybody thinks of the building. And if you go to the dictionary right now and look up the word church, it will literally say the building. Okay? It wouldn't say the people, it would say the building. Okay, so now, but the Lord didn't say, I will build my ch church he says, I will build my ecclesia. I will build my ecclesia. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> so let's continue. I cover this right now. Keep this in mind. Okay, you have to keep this in mind. Ecclesia was a secular event. And this secular event has to include all the various subgroups inside a community. And when they come together, Everyone can speak their opinions because that's how they come to a consensus and to a vote is that everyone can speak. You have to keep these two matters, uh, these kind of like two bedrock of this uh, ecclesia, what this ecclesia uh, event is, okay? Now, if, so it's very interesting that the Lord Jesus, he didn't, uh, he didn't, you know, he didn't say, I will build my temple I will build my, you know, uh, some sort of a religious thing. But he, he modeled it after a, a secular thing. Okay, he said, I will build my ecclesia. It's a secular term. It's not a religious term. There was nothing religious about ecclesia. Okay, so, but he says, I will build mine. <clears throat> so then what is a church today? So, I, so that you don't want to think that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm all negative about church. I just want to show you the positive side of what a church today is so that you understand how, where things sit, right? So a church today being a building, okay, the church is the building. Well, the building there, just like in the Roman church time, it belonged to the Catholic church, Roman church. And then during the King James time, it belonged to the uh, the, the uh, the clergyman in the, of the Anglican Church, which is under King James. Okay, so now, what about all the churches today? What about all the churches? There's so many churches today. Well, they belong to the ministry or the minister of that church, right? So if you are a minister, you are a pastor, you have a ministry, well, when you get certain people to f come to your uh, you help so many so certain people, so many people, then you, you build a church and they come to your church so that you can continue to help them. So the church today is really a place for ministry. It's somebody's ministry. Whichever church you go to is that person's ministry. Does that make sense? Right? I mean, you cannot, you cannot for example, let's say if, you, if there is a Baptist church, which is, uh, a, a pastor who is, uh, who is, uh, believes in uh, baptism by immersion, that's their, you know, that's kind of their ministry. Their ministry is to help people get baptized by immersion, okay? So if you go to that church, you will hear 
and you will be uh, uh, helped to get baptized by immersion. Okay, if you go to a Pentecostal church, then what is the pastor of the Pentecostal church? Well, they want to help people receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, specifically by the receiving of the gift of tongues. Okay, if that is that, that pastor's ministry, then you would go there. And look, they're all doing God's word, work. Okay, they, you know, the Baptist p- pastor is doing God's work to preach the gospel and baptize people. And the person who is a Pentecostal minister, he's also doing God's work to right, bring people into that experience. So all the different ministries are pastors or ministers who, have they, who believe that they've received something from the Lord that they want to preach to others, help others, and if people get help through their ministry, then they will have a church to house those people. Okay? So that means that each church today represents somebody's ministry and you cannot just go there freely to speak opposite, contrary to what that ministry is about. So if you go to a Pentecostal church, which is helping people to speak in tongues to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, you cannot go there and say speaking in tongues is of the devil. Okay? I mean, which a a large part of Christianity do. There is a whole segment of Christianity says that speaking in tongues is of the devil. Okay? That's over. It's all made up. It's fake. Okay? Well, If you are in that segment of Christianity, you cannot go to a Pentecostal church and speak that because that's his, that's that brother's ministry, right? If you don't like what he's saying, then go to another church. You understand, right? So the churches today are different ministers doing their ministry and then that way uh, you go to that church because you get help from that church Yes, Lisa? So the democracy is missing. Amen, sister. You, I'm getting to that. Absolutely right. Absolutely right. So the, you're, amen. <laughs> you pull the word right out of my mouth. So there, right, there is no representative of various factions, you know, or groups, subgroups within a church because that church is already defined. Okay, that church is defined by the ministry. Okay. Now, now, is it bad? No, it's, it's their ministry, okay? So if you look at it as a good, so uh, I, I take it as a good thing from a ministry point of view because uh, f- according to Philippians chapter one, Paul says, hey, you know, whoever is preaching the gospel, I rejoice. You know, some even try to, some even preach the gospel to, to cause me harm. I mean, can you imagine that? People would preach the gospel to cause Paul harm, right? But Paul still says, I rejoice. Well, praise the Lord. At least the gospel is being preached. So that's our, that should be our attitude to all the min- various ministries and various churches around us because gospel is being preached. If they're preaching the gospel, we should all rejoice, right? So this is not throwing stone at them. This is appreciating what they're doing. At the same time, where is the ecclesia? Right? Where is the ecclesia? Because like you said, right, all the churches today are, are dividing up believers based on their ministry. Right? <clears throat> so now the ecclesia is something that is completely in the heart of God. The ecclesia is something that is deep in his heart that, you know, these are the, these are the description of the Ecclesia, the household of God, right? The wife of Christ, the bride of Christ, the kingdom of God, the new man, the new Jerusalem. These are just big terms describing the Ecclesia. But you can't, brother, <laughs> but you can't, you know, the wife of Christ is, is just, uh, it's, it, there's only one wife of Christ. There's only one kingdom of God. There's one new man. So all these items, all these descriptions 
of the ecclesia is referring to God's people being one. And that oneness is from every tribe and tongue and nation, from every kind of believers coming together to be one, right? Oh, okay, whoops. Well, I, I could, you know, I could give this available later. Um, so, so if this is what God is after, this is God's purpose. If God's eternal purpose is his ecclesia, okay, then that means, you know, in the Old Testament, whether you get cursed or you get blessed is based on whether you follow the law. I think we all know that, right? If you, if you keep the law, you're blessed. If you break the law, you're cursed. Okay, that was the, that was the gauge. That's the measurement. That's the, uh, uh, you know, that's the, the rule for God's judgment is whether you keep the law or break the law. Then, well, in the New Testament, of course, we know the law is over, right? We're not judged based on whether we break the law or keep the law, right? I hope we all agree with that, right? We, it's all based on faith, Right? It's the faith of Jesus Christ that free us completely from God's judgment. It's got nothing to do with whether I keep the law of the old, old, old covenant or break the law of the old covenant. It's all about the faith of Jesus Christ. So then what is, what is, is there, that means is there uh, no blessing or cursing today, you know, as believers? Well, a lot of believers would just say, well, as long as I believe in Jesus, then I'm, I'm blessed. Right? And I don't need to worry about judgment. Well, but is that true? Right? Is that true? Right? So when, what is the, what is the uh, measurement? Right? Well, how, what's the standard of our blessing and cursing today? Well, my, uh, you know, <coughs> my uh, suggestion is that it's based on, well, first let me read, let's read this. Well, in Matthew 16, 18, right after he says that I will build my ecclesia, ecclesia, says that Satan's gate will be crushed. Okay, that's how Satan is defeated, is through his ecclesia. When the believers are one, Satan is crushed. Is that a blessing or a cursing? Yeehaw. Yeah, that's a blessing, right? All of our trouble is because of this, of this enemy, adversary. Well, Ecclesia crushes the enemy, right? His gates cannot hold back the Ecclesia. Then what about Ephesians 1, 20, 22? You know, Troy and some of you brothers and, and even a number of brothers and sisters and brothers and sisters here, brothers and sisters, you know, in the Bay Area, you know, you guys are experiencing a lot of power, right? Authority, authority and power. Well, According to Ephesians, you know where the authority and power is to? It's to the ecclesia. It's to the ecclesia. His resurrection power, his ascension power, his sub everything is subjected under his feet, and, and he is head over all things. That's all to the ecclesia. So if you want to receive all the power that's been, that the Lord has has accomplished, have received, well, if you're not building the ecclesia, you're going to miss out. If you're, in, if you're building the ecclesia, all the power is, is toward that, right? So that's why I asked Troy, you know, that question. Troy, you know, you guys are experiencing so many good things, right? Can you, is that directly related to the oneness of the body? Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Right? And uh, so then God's command, his blessing, Psalm 133, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. There, God commanded. He commanded the blessing of life. You know, are we begging for blessings? A lot of Christians are begging for blessings. But here when you're in oneness, God is commanding the blessings. Do you want God to command blessings on you? Yes. Yes then it's on oneness, it's on ecclesia, okay? But then there's cursing. You say, well, what, what's the cursing? Well, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, when there was division in the body, 
Paul says that that's why some of you are sick, you're weak, and you even die. Okay, we could take it spiritually or we could take it physically. But anyway, there is such a thing there, right, in 1 Corinthians 11, and I'll get to that a little bit later, but that it's, com it's totally related to whether we are in a division, in a faction, being factious or not. Okay, if we are factious, if we don't want to, if we don't receive other believers, if we want to keep to ourselves, then the Lord, Paul said, then you are eating and drinking judgment. Judgment. You're eating and drinking condemnation, okay, to yourself. When we, this is referring to eating and drinking the, you know, the bread and the cup. Okay, so, so this is very serious. So today, you know, we believers, we, we, we want the Lord's blessing, right? And we don't want to be judged by the Lord. Well, here it is. It's all related to ecclesia. If we are for the ecclesia, we're for the oneness of the body, then the Lord is pouring out. He's just going, go. What do you need? Just, you got everything. I'm going to command it on you. Right? And, uh, and if you're going to break up his ecclesia by causing division, causing factions, then he says, well, there's judgment. So look at today's among Christianity today. I mean, so many believers. You know, there's like, you know, 75% supposedly, right? 75% of the U.S. claims that they believe in Jesus Christ and the Bible. That includes Catholics and, and Protestants, right? But look at where is the, where is the power? I mean, if 75% are believers, where is the power? Right, where is the power? But yet, there is this judgment of weakness and sickness and spiritual death. You see, so, so there you go, right? You could be at the best ministry and you do get some help, but eventually, if it's not for the building up of the one body, then you're missing, either you're missing out a big portion of the blessing or you may even fall into God's judgment. So it's very serious. Okay, so <clears throat> now who, who, are, who, is the, uh, who are the members of the Ecclesia? Yes, who's, Alan, who is it? us but you have to have that full assurance that every single believer every single believer is a member of the ecclesia that's the constituent of the ecclesia is every single believer so we use you know we use this one verse but uh, there are many verses but here's one is of course peter remembered what the lord said to him lord when he says you are the christ the son of the living god then away right away Jesus said, you are Peter, right? You are Peter, and, uh, and I'm going to build you in, on the, upon this rock. I will build my ecclesia. So Peter remembered that. So when he wrote his epistles, he says, you yourselves, indeed you have tasted. So who's that? Anyone who have tasted that the Lord is good. If you've tasted the Lord is good, and you have come to Jesus as a living stone, if you've done that, then you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up a spiritual house. So who, who, what, who makes up the ecclesia? It's everyone who's tasted Jesus, who's come to Jesus, right? Okay? So that's, that's all the believers. Now, so now <clears throat> we go to, well, where is the... If, if all the believers are, are members of the Ecclesia, then where is the reality of the Ecclesia? The reality of the Ecclesia is in our fellowship. So when you are in a faction, means that you stand apart from those that are not in your faction. Okay, so let's say I'm in a faction of uh, Pentecostal tongue speakers, and I'm really in that faction, if I'm really in that faction, then I would consider those that are not tongue speakers to be different than me. 
and I don't treat them the same way as I treat my fellow tongue speakers. Okay, and that could go, e that could go both ways, right? Uh, so if you're not a tongue speaker, you are a cessationist. Okay, cessationist means that uh, there's no more such spirit, spiritual manifestation and there's a large group of Christianity that is in that camp, then you'll say, anybody, I say, I don't want to fellowship with this brother who's, who speaks in tongues because they're talking gibberish. And uh, it's just opening up the door for demons. So that's, that's demonic possession. I'm not going to talk to that person. Right? So, but that's all, I mean, there's so many different factions. So what is fellowship? Fellowship is to be able to Give and receive. Okay, so let's talk about this verse here. This is, the, this is just one of the, such a beautiful verse. And it covers the matter of fellowship and the matter of Trinity. So this verse says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Spirit be with you all. So here is the, the Trinity. The Trinity is made up of Father, Son and Holy Spirit, right? Now these three, they are three, but yet they are absolutely one, right? I think we believe that, right? They're one, yet they're absolutely three. Well, we don't know how that could be, but it is, right? He's one and he's three. Now, between this one, three God, that's why we call Trinity, or triune God, is that between this three one God, well, they have fellowship, right? Fellowship literally means you share what you have. Okay, whatever you have, you share. That's fellowship. Okay, so within the Trinity, there is perfect fellowship. That means that the Father shares with the Son, the Son shares with the Father. They have the same mind. They have the same love. They have the same glory. And, and this sharing is, is done by the Holy Spirit. So there is this perfect fellowship within. So there he, the Father is full of love and the Lord Jesus, I mean, he's full of grace. And, and yet, and this fellowship is going on uh, in the Holy Spirit within the three. But now these three or this one, well, he is not happy to be just by himself. I mean, he's so full. He's, fu he's full of, I mean, his riches unlimited. But here he is just within the three, sharing within the three. So God purposed in eternity. He says, I want to share. I want to flow. I want to share with another person. Okay, outside of us three or, or us one, you know, however you want to say it, okay? And uh, well, so you know, that is humanity. That is man. So when he created man, male and female, his whole view is that he can pour himself out, share with humanity his love and his grace and everything of, 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 the, of the Trinity, everything. He just wanted to share, th and that's fellowship, right? He, that, is, that is God wanting to pour himself out to us, okay? So now, um, so this fellowship is uniquely of the Holy Spirit, okay? Okay, so I want to bring out something, which I don't know whether you all know this, but let me ask you, when was the first time the word koinonia, which is the Greek word for fellowship, when was it first used? Do you know the first time it was used? Let me ask Dennis or Daniel. Daniel or Dennis. You know the first time it was used? Okay, it's a, it's a great word, right? Mm -hmm. Catherine? Catherine, right? Mm -hmm. Catherine. Okay. Do you know when the first time? No. Okay. So when was the first time Fel koinonia, fellowship was used in the New Testament. Well, it was in Acts chapter 2. Okay, Acts chapter 2. Then you say, well, why in Acts chapter 2? Because shouldn't 
fellowship been going on? I mean, fellowship, if you look at the uh, English uh, uh, dictionary, fellowship or even the Greek dictionary, fellowship means communication, sharing, right? Communion, uh, partnership, right? So there is this, this, uh, this is fellowship. But you'll say, well, how come there was no fellowship before uh, Acts chapter 2? I mean, wasn't Jesus there among the believers, right? Wasn't Jesus sharing food with the believers? Wasn't Jesus sharing, you know, speaking to the believers even in, uh, at the Last Supper? How come that's not called koinonia? How come koinonia wasn't used in the Last Supper? They were, I mean, he was pouring out his heart, but koinonia was not used, okay? And then it's not until uh, chapter 2 of Acts. So here's my proposal to you, okay? Is that fellowship is not just God wanting to share with us, but God wants us to share what he's shared with us. Okay, it's not just being a receiver. Okay, you have to be a giver. And so... The believers, the, the, the disciples, they received Jesus as the Spirit in John chapter 20. Right? John chapter 20, 22, the Lord breathed unto them and says, Receive the Holy Spirit. Okay? So they received the Spirit there. But it still didn't use the word koinonia. Okay? It was not until Acts chapter 2. What, what happened in Acts chapter 2? Acts chapter 2 is when the Spirit got poured out. When the Spirit got poured out, they became empowered to now speak and share what the Lord has poured out into them. Okay, now there is fellowship. Koinonia started. is because now the Spirit of all the triune God is could be poured into the believers and the believers can pour into others. So if we are not a receiver and a giver, then there's no fellowship. Okay? So fellowship includes, so if you just go to, go to a ministry, go to church, and you get a lot of, uh, receive a lot, uh, uh, you get a lot, a lot of good teaching, a lot of good help, which is fine, right? You're receiving. But if you're not, able to share and give what you have received, then it's not koinonia. You know, so from this you can see that there is a dis clear distinction between churches today, okay, as ministries. They're there to give and we're there to receive as a, from these ministries. But the ecclesia, like you said, has to be a gathering, a calling out of of believers from various backgrounds and subgroups. So the ecclesia is a place where the a Pentecostal believer can feel welcome, uh, where a brother who's a sister who doesn't speak in tongue is also equally welcome. One who thinks that you can lose your salvation is welcome. And once you think you cannot lose your salvation is welcome. Well, anyway, anybody think that that could be divided, the believers that are now are being called together in the ecclesia, ecclesia to have fellowship. Okay, to have fellowship so that they can all share with one another what the Lord is doing in their lives. So there is a brother that is speaking in tongues. The Lord is really working in his life through that gift. And, well, he could be able to share that without someone condemning him. But the one who doesn't speak in tongues, right, can f feel equally included to share how the Lord is doing, working in him without speaking in tongues, by studying the Bible, let's say, right? And, and so they can all share Jesus with one another, and that's the ecclesia. Oh, um, so anyway, I, I have more slides later, but, uh, but let's just open up to any uh, questions or thoughts, uh, then maybe I can just jump in um, as I answer them. Yeah. You spoke of the Ecclesia. 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 Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, well, Ecclesia, of course, 
the secular ecclesia happened in Acts 19. Okay, Acts 19 was the secular ecclesia. That's when Ephesus, where the silversmith Demetrius, I think, uh, is the one who uh, stirred up the crowd, and they all gathered together um, at the amphitheater of some sort, and, uh, and that was called an ecclesia. Okay, <clears throat> and of course, the Lord's ecclesia is used about 70 times uh, in, the, uh, in Acts and in, in the epistles. So every time you see church, it's actually ecclesia. So just substitute the word church for ecclesia, and that's, that's the Greek word. Uh, Daniel? Can you define the two terms, believer and then heresy, um, so that you know, Christ and ecclesia doesn't become, a, in someone's mind, like a breeding ground for heresy? Okay, that, that's a good point. Now, um, heresy is actually um, a word where we, the Greek word, comes from the same word as factions okay so uh, you know when we say heresy today it sounds like it's way off you know way off base or something like that but in in the in the Greek word is is standing apart is being factious okay that's being her heretical is being factious okay so a believer there is uh, uh, there is five items of the faith that makes us a believer Okay, what's the first one? Well, Jesus is God, right? He's divine, he's God, right? That's number one. Jesus is God who became a man. Okay, you have to believe that Jesus is a God man. He's 100% God, 100% man. And this God man, Jesus, died on the cross, right? He died on the cross, and then three days later, he resurrected. Praise the Lord. And then he ascended, and today he's the Lord. He's the Lord over all. And if you proclaim that he is Lord, then he comes to dwell in you, right, as the Spirit of Christ. Okay, that is the faith. That is the faith. That is what makes us a believer. Okay, so now, if that is the faith, then there are a lot of other things. Of course, we Christians aren't really arguing about those items. Those are the items that is common between us. That's not an item of argument unless they are not of the faith. For example, if you are a Jehovah Witness in that kind of a church, they don't believe that Jesus is God, right? Then we would say they're not of the faith. Now, it doesn't mean that there are not some believers in the as a Jehovah Witness, go to Jehovah Witness Church. But in general, their teaching is not of the faith. Okay, so, so the argument among believers that goes to most of your you know, typical evangelical churches and so forth is not over the faith. It's over a lot of other things. A lot of other things. Okay, so is the faith that makes us one. That's our basis for fellowship. Our basis of fellowship is the faith. So this heresy issue is, you know, is kind of, uh, we can make anything as a faction, heresy being the word faction, we can make anything into a faction. Anything. I mean, you could make, uh, whether you play the piano or not, into a faction. Whether you have drum in your service or not, into a faction whether, you know, a musical instrument, whether, yeah. So all those things you could say are heresies if you make it into a faction, if you say that's what, you know, this is us, this defines us, and you're not defined that way, that becomes a faction, okay? And, and, we, and we need to fellowship with all believers of the same faith in order to break out of our factiousness, Okay, so we need to reach out. So I didn't get to cover Romans 16 is where we are commanded to uh, greet, uh, proactively greet other believers that's around us. If we don't, then we're factious. Then that is heretical, you might say. Okay, so as long as they're preaching Jesus is God who became man, who died on the cross, resurrected on the third day, right, and who is now Lord of all, and if we proclaim him to be Lord of all, then he comes, comes into us. 
Okay, so if, any, if it's not that, that gospel, then it's a, different, it's a different Jesus. So Romans 16 is the last chapter of Romans, and typically that chapter uh, from teachers, commentary, uh, point of view is more like a, uh, you know, rolling of the credit after the movie is over. Okay, and, uh, and it's not really needed. There's all the theology is completed by chapter 15. Okay, there's no more theology after chapter 15 is really, you know, so 16, whether you study it or not, is, is, uh, is really not that big of a deal. Okay, so um, my uh, proposal is that, well, the crushing of the enemy didn't happen until the end of chapter 16. So that's got to be a good ending point, crushing the enemy. So if, if everything is done in chapter 15, then why isn't crushing the enemy at the end of chapter 15? The fact that it's in the end of chapter 16 means that that chapter 16 is needed for crushing the enemy, <laughs> okay? <laughs> All right, so what is chapter 16? Well, most Bible teacher, as, 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 as far as I know, all bi Bible teachers that I have looked up into, and if you find one that is different, let me know. I would like to con contact him. Is that, what's that? You, you point? Here's a unique one. He's, unique. Yeah, okay. Okay, so, so the thing is that <laughs> chapter 16, uh, most bi uh, Bible teacher is teaching that that is Paul himself doing the greeting. Is Paul asking the b saints there to greet those believers for him. You know, it's like, Troy, can you greet Doug for me? Right, can you be, greet, greet the Roy, Ron for me? Okay, so it's I'm greeting, uh, but Troy is doing it for me. But that's not the, 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 uh, the meaning there, or that's not the word there. The word there is I'm commanding you to go greet these other believers. Okay, now in, in Rome, they, or, they were already segregated into groups in Rome. There were at least five groups in Rome of various kinds of believers. Uh, they were already segregated. So Paul was engineering the oneness of the body by commanding them to go greet other believers that are not in their comfort zone. They are not in the group that they normally associate with even if they were in a group called the ecclesia, ecclesia, which is what God is building, well, you can't stay there. You have to go and greet other believers. So that greeting there is not just saying hi, right? When you walk by someone, you know, I, I, you know, I got met Alan. I say, hey, Alan, you know, hi, walk by, say hi. No, if I want to greet Alan, uh, you know, I should sit down with Alan, you know, get a cup of coffee or invite him for a meal. And then say, Alan, what's, what's happening? Well, how, how'd you come to the Lord? Right? Can you tell me your story? Right? And then he would ask me and I would share with him. See, so there is a, so normally in those days, greeting, you usually go to someone's house to do that. And if you receive that person's greeting, you would receive them into your house. Okay? So you spend some time uh, together. And so that was Paul's way of engineering the oneness, the one fellowship of the body is by commanding them to go and greet all these other believers. So today, Which are factions. they were factions, right? They were factions, except for the ecclesia. Okay, they were not a faction, but if they don't go greet, they, becomes a, they become a faction. Right. Okay. So <clears throat> Well, right, except that the greeting there is, is not organizational, right? So we have to be, be, you know, be clear there uh, that in Romans 16, you're greeting individuals, right? All these names there, they're individuals. There's no name of an organization there, right? They're all, so, you, for example, you cannot greet the ga Catholic Church, but you can greet a Catholic believer. Amen. You see what I'm saying? You can't greet the Baptist Church. You, but you can greet a, a believer who's going to the Baptist church. So that means in, in, in the view of Ecclesia, we don't see the labels. 
We don't see the labels of Catholic, Baptist, Presbyterian, Pentecostal. We only see believers as believers. That's it. No labels. They're just believers. So we go greet them as believers. So when we, so if we can, let's say, what would happen in Sacramento if all the churches, all the ministries, on Sunday morning, they preach, they preach their preaching. At the end of their preaching, they would say, okay, this week, every one of you, Go find a believer that you don't you're usually fellowship with and go and sit down, have a cup of coffee with them and have some fellowship with them. What do you think would happen in Sacramento? Right? In Ro yeah. yeah. <laughs> Revival would happen. You know, if, 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 if uh, right, if, if uh, Destiny and, you know, Adventure, right, they got, what, maybe 30,000 believers, you know, between them. I mean, if they're just out there greeting all the believers, right, in their work, at, their, at, the, at the neighborhood, in the school, they're just saying, let's have some fellowship. And it uh, doesn't matter if you're Pentecostal, it doesn't matter. They're not going to want to come back on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't know. I, I think they will. They will. But anyway, but the point is, that's, that's, what, that's what needs to be done, is that there needs to be a, a proactive greeting of, of believers, among us okay so that's Romans 16 it's so because of that greeting then Paul could say the God of peace shall soon crush Satan under your feet shortly you say so the God of peace is is activated when there is the greeting between saints that are normally segregated from each other Yes, amen, and you won't be under judgment, but under blessing. Okay, so remember that you mentioned about uh, that's not democracy? Okay, if you read uh, 1 Corinthians 11, uh, verse 18, there it says that when the ec ecclesia comes together, there it's necessary to have factions. It's necessary to have factions so that those that are approved may be made manifest. Now, I won't, again, I won't get into the detail, but I just want you to think about this. Ecclesia in the Greek practice has to have representation from all quarters of that community. If it doesn't have representation, then it's not Ecclesia. Okay, it's a fraternity. It's not an Ecclesia. So here now, Paul says, when the Lord's ecclesia comes together, there has to be factions. There has to be factions. So that shows the clear distinction between a ministry and ecclesia. See, in a ministry, you cannot have factions. They'll kick you out or you'll leave. Okay? But in ecclesia, you can't get kicked out. So the ecclesia needs needs the factions that means receiving but you cannot stay factious okay you cannot stay factious you come in the faction but once you get to the ecclesia you have to be open so the approved ones are the ones that bring people together the approved ones are the ones that can fellowship with with everyone so if there's no approved ones in an ecclesia then it would just blow up it would be chaos okay but the approved ones are the peacemakers. They make sure everyone comes to Christ, mm -hmm. focus on Christ, and he, they can fellowship with everyone mm -hmm. no matter what faction they belong to, peacemakers. right? They're the peacemakers. Like Ron, like Ron. amen. <laughs> <laughs> so praise the Lord, amen. Well, well, yeah, I think it's really clear because you're, what you're saying <laughs> is not that, well, there has to be, it's necessary that there are factions. You're saying, what you're really saying here is there will be factions. It's yes. Yes. There will be division. It's unavoidable. Right. There will be sect. That's un unavoidable. But it's when you become sectarian, when you become factious, yeah. when you become divisive, mm. then, you know, that's when we lose it. Right. We lose the oneness of the body. Right. And yeah. uh, I think if everybody realizes right. that, that's so, that so what we are. Right. So, for example, let's say I, I speak in tongues. I come to uh, the ecclesia. Right? Doesn't mean that I give up my tongue speaking, yeah. even though maybe, uh, you know, nobody else in that ecclesia does. 
It, but I cannot, I mean, let's say there's a few that speaks, they, they, they speak, we, we speak in tongues. Okay, so um, to be factious, now, first of all, that's a faction already. Okay, I got called out. That's a faction. Okay, it's, I'm different than, than Troy who doesn't speak in tongues. Okay, let's say, right? Um, so we're, we're already different. But factious means I will not talk, to, I will not fellowship with Troy because he doesn't speak in tongues. And Troy w won't fellowship with, with us because we speak in tongues. Right? So we need somebody like, you know, John, who, who goes, well, you know what? I can fellowship with this brother. I can fellowship over here. Right? So John's, uh, John is not, you know, bothered. He's just fellowshiping with everybody. And then John will say, hey, brother, why don't you come over and meet Troy? Oh, Troy is a great brother. Right? Even though he doesn't speak in tongues, he's a great brother. You got to listen to his testimony. So by, by, Troy, by John doing that, I was like, okay, yeah. So now I go over to that brother to listen to his testimony. So now I'm not factious. You see, I, I'm st I, I'll still keep speaking in tongues. doesn't mean I stop, but it just means now I'm no longer factious, right? Now I can fellowship with other believers that are not like me. Okay? Amen. Yeah. Praise the Lord for Henry, man. Amen.